Hi. So somebody asked me recently if I could put my philosophy in a bunch of bullet points, and they said, well, not that you should reduce your philosophy to this bullet pointism, but, but I'm actually fine with that. The problem with bullet points is that I love them a lot, and there's sort of a skeptical tradition, because the skepticals love to have their own little commandments, but being skeptics, you know, they had a lot of lists. You know, it's like 10 commandments, why not 7? Why not 5? How about 11? And so the thing is, when you create lists, the, the form of the list you want to create affects uh, what you decide, like, I do, I want to list a 10, and so you think a 10, and then you start making all the bullet points sort of at the same scale, and I just realized that's not really what I want, probably. I do want to do that, but part of the, the what I thought was attractive about this idea is, yeah, I should just simplify it down, and they, the points should not all be scale, they should just be things I pretty much believe in, whether they made logical sense uh, coherently with each other or not, um, I just leave that to the results and not make sure that the list, you know, work to make it all consistent like that. So the first couple points I've thought of, and uh, one of them is just that I'm a natural philosopher, okay? And this means that I look to nature for the final, this, I think philosophy is empirical. To me, it's all about these uh, qualia that, that, uh, that I get and I, I gauge which ones I value more, which ones matter more, which ones are more important, which ones I'm going to judge based on first versus second versus third. And I always look for nature. Um, and in that sense, nature is beyond my judgments of morality or anything else because I look to nature for the answer. I'm listening to this stream. That makes me empirical. And this is why I'm against metaphysics because that's unnatural. It's natural for people to believe in metaphysics, ironically, but metaphysics says that it's beyond nature. And to me, there isn't anything that should want to be or could possibly be beyond nature. It makes no sense to me. I'm studying nature and everything I study is nature, I believe, uh, not just by virtue of me studying it, but because, you know, it interacts with me. That's, that makes it nature. Okay. The second bullet point is that I think we are the creators of language, that language is still going on. I constantly am faced with people, uh, the things like a term like knowledge, uh, saying that, no, it means this particular thing, and that's what it has to mean. No. All terms are like scientific theories, okay? There's an empirical side, the extension, you know, and then there's this interpretation, this theoretical side meant to explain that extension. So, for example, coyotes, okay? We've known what coyotes were for a long time. I mean, if you take the we of people where coyote lives, or choose an animal of, of, your, of your liking. Okay. The first idea, the first theory, is, um, is morphological, generally, right? But before there's even that theory uh, from the morphology, we have this pattern recognition. We have seen a lot of coyotes. That's the extension of coyotes. We abstract the pattern out and say, okay, let's describe the pattern. That'll be our interpretation, you know, morphologically. But now, in modern times, we don't accept that. It doesn't. It's not that something looks like a coyote, right? Painting of a coyote could look like a coyote. Or in a mythological example, you know, a god could turn into a coyote. You know, if it looked like a coyote, morphologically, you'd say it really was a coyote. A god it turned into, the way we say it, it would be depending on the genes. Yeah, if a god formed a, a mirage of a coyote, that's just a mirage of a coyote. And we use a genetic interpretation of what it means to be a coyote. You know, and again, if, if, if a pair of coyotes had an offspring that was just a ball of fur and looked nothing like a coyote, we would still say it was a coyote because it would have the genetics of a coyote. But morphologically, if, if it had to have fangs of a certain way and ears of a certain way, that might not count as a coyote. So we've improved it with this genetic, but much more hardcore kind of definition after the fact, based on the fact that we have an idea of this extension of coyotes. If you get a really good theory, you might change what you think is in the extension, but it generally goes the other way. And it's the same way with knowledge. You know, it's the same way with knowledge. We have examples of knowledge, you know. Jen can fix a car, you know. Joe can play guitar. You know, Sam can make baskets. You know, Samantha knows how to raise fruit trees. These are knowledge, examples of knowledge. Now we have a theory about a knowledge, granted it's thousands of years old, that came to think that, well, knowledge is this certain stuff, and this is how we become certain about it. Then they realize, well, there is nothing certain like that. Well, maybe mathematics is certain. Well, no, it turns out even mathematics is not certain by these skepticisms. So nothing 
So, so the theory of knowledge is that that whole set of knowledge that, that John knows how to fix a car, no, he doesn't actually know. I'm sorry, you, you know, the theory is wrong at that point. At the point that your theory doesn't pick out anything in the extension, it's a theory about something else. Maybe it's very interesting, useful theory, but it's not about knowledge. I can still come back and say, look, here's all this stuff we call knowledge, and then I can come up with a, a definition of knowledge that explains how that actually, you know, works and, and why I'm... I'm in, but it won't be knowledge because it won't be absolutely certain. Well, being absolutely certain was never what made something knowledge. What makes something knowledge is that you can get the, a result. You know, you can take some condition that you recognize, you can exert will and get some other condition that is recognizable and you can predict that ahead of time that's knowledge okay it doesn't have to be perfect to be knowledge okay so people take these thousands of years old definitions as if well no that's how it's defined why would i have to accept that i don't accept a thousand year old definition of celestial mechanics why in philosophy well because not all philosophy is natural philosophy people that aren't natural philosophers some of them think that you're just in a world of your own creation. There is no ramifications. There's nothing to judge. So just think what you want. But in natural philosophy, that's not true. Your ideas have to hold up in nature. You have to find them playing out in nature somewhere and in your perceptions, okay, that you can confirm them, which brings you back to reality and an empirical process that is, you know, knowledge oriented. It's not science in the sense of being about the things that science, the subset of knowledge is about, but it's empirical. Okay, but it is empirical and can be empirical. Okay, so in terms of language, you know, that's the second bullet point is that we need to improve and fix language. Okay, so those are the first two.